This meeting is being Hi, it's Marco from Moose, Market PR, the editor of Punchline Magazine, and welcome to Punchline Talks, the business breakfast briefings, and a big ho-ho from me and the rest of the panel. It's our Christmas special. I'd like to invite the panel to review the morning newspapers, find out what's going on in the sort of business sectors, and finally, what's caught their eye in this week's Punchline. So let me catch you up with the panel. We'd like to introduce Alex Cottrell the, from the Grow Pub, Sam Halliday from the Federation of Small Business, Ian Mean from Business West, Laurie Lee from the Cheltenham Trust, Neil Ricketts from the Sarian, and Talitha Nelson from Gloucester Community Foundation. Good morning, everybody. Fantastic to see you. We're going to quickly morning. rattle morning. through the papers and uh, let's have a look there, courtesy of the BBC. So, The Guardian. Tories join Sunak to open pay talk with nurses. The Daily Express, for nurses for Britain, sit down and sort this out. The I, NHS crisis puts every ambulance trust under extreme pressure. The Daily Telegraph, NHS on high alert for flu outbreak. The Mirror, this is what comp compassion looks like. The Daily Star, dad told whoppers, my scary brother screamed at me. <clears throat> I think everybody's brother screamed at them sometimes. The Times, Harry deepens rift with screaming William Jive. The Daily Mail, dignity in the face of treachery in the Financial Times. B, uh, ECB and the BOE, interest rate rises signal resolve in tough fight against inflation. That's all the headlines today. Let's start off with you, Sam, as I always like to start with you when you're on the show. Welcome to Punchline Talks, everybody. Welcome. Morning. Welcome. Right. Morning. Yeah, that's Hello. Morning. Got? Morning. Well, Mark, I mean, the one consistent, they're all quite different then from pages, weren't they? But the one consistent was you'll find something about the royals there on all of them. So I won't go there. I'm sure somebody else will, but I won't go there. Um, other than the one that you didn't show, because I went and bought the papers this morning, was the Sun, which actually called them traitors, but I won't say no more than that. No, I've I've gone on to the um I've gone on to the, to look at the eye and looked at some business coverage and two stories that leapt out at me, actually. Um, one of them says that businesses may receive further help with bills. Now, this is something we at the FSB have been calling for, because you may know that um, businesses are going to get energy support until the end of um, March. So from the 1st of April, they were originally going to be on their own. Well, they're now talking about extending that, not just to sort of a small group of businesses, it was originally thought, but to all businesses. And that will be very good news, I think, because... Um, and no good getting through what could be one of the worst winters many businesses have ever faced. So then suddenly find in April, you're not going to get support with utility bills and it's all going to be crashing down again. So that was good news. Less good news is on the other side um, about mortgages. Now, I speak to as somebody that's house business has been on the market twice this year and twice um, the people had bought it, pulled out because when they went to collect their mortgage, the rates had gone up. The second one was right in the middle of Liz Truss's um, campaign, which I now that I hereby declare as somebody that's been interested in politics since I could read, basically, um, is the worst prime minister left, right or centre this country's ever had. And the damage he did, forget about me selling my house, that was irrelevant, but, you know, the damage is going to go on for a long time. And that figure's frightening. So people like me that are on a tracker, and the reason we were on a tracker was because we thought we were going to be selling, so we didn't have to worry too much about it, are getting punished every month. If the... Postal strike isn't on next week. I will get a letter from HSBC saying how much more my mortgage is going to be in January. They've written to me so many times this year. It's ridiculous. And it's just not funny. I mean, I, I, my mortgage isn't massive at the moment in terms of uh, how much I've got left to pay. But the average person could face £500 increases. And this is just madness. And, uh, and, and as, as somebody who represents businesses, people aren't going to have money to spend with businesses because they're too busy keeping their house warm and paying the mortgage. And I think there's been a lot of attention about utilities, understandably, which we just mentioned, but the mortgage stuff is really, really serious. And not everybody's on um, fixed mortgages. And if they are, they're going to come to an end. And when they come to an end, that's when people are going to get the problems. So very gloomy. Good news, one side, not so good news the other side. And it's nice coming from a man who's wearing antlers as well. It, it's hard for me to take myself seriously, let alone anyone else, but we're going to do it. <laughs> It was well put, well put. Well, thank you very much for that, so I totally agree. Let's go to you, Alex. Hi there, good morning. Great to have you on the show. Good what morning. What for us? <clears throat> well, I was having a look at the papers, and as Sam, there appeared to be a vast selection of doom and gloom chucked in with a bit of Harry and Meghan. Um, so I'm avoiding all of that. Um, and the story that I picked up this morning was actually on the BBC, and it's talking about the fact that um, Black Friday fails to boost retail sales. 
Um, and obviously what's happened is that the numbers have come back in from the, the retail activity with Black Friday, where it's basically saying that in terms of sort of standard retail gifts and that sort of thing, um, sort of sales expected fell well below what was, you know, fell short of what was expected. However, that sales of food and drink um, sort of looked more positive. And I just think there's a couple of things there. Obviously, I sort of stand here representing business, if you like. There is a very clear element of uncertainty, you know, that, that I think will have had a massive impact on this in terms of people trying to really, really have to think about where to put their spend. You know, do we spend it, do we splurge on the gifts or do we, do we spend it on the basics in terms of the food? I took quite a positive spin from that insofar as I think, you know, certainly from my side and I think as, as well throughout, people are seeing the quality and, uh, you know, the benefit of just time with family you know, more so than who needs another pair of socks. Um, so I took a positive from that in that people are still spending spending on the food. I do also think that as consumers, we have now also got used to the fact that we know on Christmas Eve prices are going to fall through the floor. So I just question whether things like Black Friday hold the appeal that they used to have because there seem to be sales going on constantly. But I just thought it was an interesting story because I think it is reflected in what's going on in the world of business as well. Um, you know, there is so much uncertainty the things that it's almost like the only certainty is the fact that nothing's certain um especially when it comes to you know interest rates energy prices supply chain problems all of that sort of stuff so what we've sort of seen at the growth hubs is you know still fantastic levels of engagement with businesses um but kind of a lack of short-term planning if, if that's if that's an appropriate thing to say you know you might be able to say okay well that's to do with the fact that we're coming up to the end of the year but for a lot of businesses you know this is this is kind of budget time now in fact we're probably post budget time you know people are looking at what their their spend profiles are going to be for next year but there just seems to be a bit of a sit and wait and okay well let's just get through christmas and let's see what we look like on the other side of january because it is basically impossible to forecast at the moment and i kind of think that's also being seen in the consumer world the one thing i would say though is that as much as we're hearing lots of doom and gloom stories about profits and all of that sort of stuff there are some real winners in all of this as well i think it was h&m i think i saw you know have had um have had a profit yeah. increase and you know they do what they do and they do it brilliantly you know they never purport to be quality um you know they are, have got on a massive drive for sustainability um you know it is relatively fast fashion but slightly more ethical so i think they're a really good example amongst other sort of local independents as well of of where service customer experience and agility um are the kind of watchwords for success and survival at the moment so i think Whilst the story itself about Black Friday sales potentially looks quite negative, I think there's a good part in that, which is about the fact that people are still spending on food and obviously the experience of spending time with family and friends and stuff like that. Plus the fact there are some winners out there as well. OK, thank you very much. Very good. Massive overview of what's the, the retail sector there. And I totally agree with you. And the other big player to yesterday was uh, Mountain Warehouse. Did mm. fantastically well. 300% mm. sales increase. Mm. Neil, yeah. I'm going to go over to you now. Thanks ever so much for that, Alex. Neil. What have you picked up for us? You, you're, you're muted, which I quite enjoyed. <laughs> I thought you'd done that deliberately, Mark. That's not the first time you've put me on mute. Um, <laughs> so I picked, I mean, you can't go anywhere without looking at the strikes, you know. We're, we, um, the one thing I would point out or, or talk about is we're becoming very polarised, you know. Do you strike? Don't you strike? Do you drive an electric car? Do you drive a petrol car? Are you pro climate change are you against climate change you know all of these things that the whole society has become so polarized now uh, a, a bit of a point on the uh, on the on the the increase in sales is that down to inflation you know I, I don't know about everybody else but i'm seeing that my food bill has gone through the roof uh, there were some interesting statistics that 80 percent of the sales items on black friday were actually cheaper for you know at other times in the year than mm -hmm. they were and and do we, as you say, do we uh, do we wait for the sales now uh, rather than because it's become kind of um, the thing? You know, if you want to buy an Amazon device, you'd be you know you'd be foolish to buy it at any other time than Black Friday when it's forty five percent off. Um, it was you know putting a bit of a positive spin on things. Uh, the health minister has said that she could see green shoots if you believe the government. I mean, uh, that's a that, that's a big question in itself. Um, but you know. Uh, we're, we're we're seeing a number of people, including Andrew Bailey, saying that inflation has peaked. Now, I don't know about everybody else, but you know, I'll be glad to see that as a as a business owner. Uh, everything we do is moving up. I think there's a temptation connected with the strikes that if we do put the prices or we do put the wage bills up significantly, 
how do we remain competitive in a global market which is also challenged uh, and so i'm much more in favor of having cost of living bonuses which are paid at a specific moment in time rather than necessarily loading the business with a labor rate that you know is in, you know, is unsubstantial I think by far the biggest conversation I've had with um, with the LEP is about my worry about jobs and um, again link to that uh, that thing about you know are we are we competitive uh, but the underlying uh, unemployment rate is really really low and that means that if you do have job vacancies mm -hmm. you can't fill them anyway mm -hmm. uh, and so I don't know you know my view is that that may change in the coming months I think Christmas people can get through I don't know what impact I'd be interested in Sam's view as to you know when people do do those budgets uh what the new year looks like because you know I'm looking at a relatively pessimistic outlook for the general economy uh, I don't see those green shoots but there again I don't see the antibiotics either uh and so um uh you know I think we've got to be very careful about um about you know some of these stories uh, the biggest thing I would say is, look, I, I, I agree. I think it's more quality than quantity now. I think people have got to pull their, uh, their, their, their kind of spending in. And I, I for one, are, are trying to buy as much locally as I can. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's not only that's a double win, that's sustainability for the local economy, but also sustainability for, uh, for, the, um, for the environment as well. Okay. The good news story I had out of the citizen was uh, one lucky person in the Forest of Dean won a million pounds, which I think is fantastic. I'm a great supporter of the lottery. I'd love to see more uh, smaller prizes than necessarily the one guy who won 170 million in Gloucestershire. But my biggest story came out of the sun today, and I think it sums up Christmas, which is Britain's saddest cat who has no teeth and can't meow finds a home at Christmas. What a great oh. Christmas story. And there's a lovely <laughs> picture of the, I'm not a great cat lover. I prefer dogs. But I mean, actually, do you know what? If you've got no teeth and you can't meow, there's hope for you yet, Mark. OK? <laughs> Here we go. So, someone will put up with me. Thank you very much for that, Neil. Right. I'm going to go to Laurie now. Laurie, thanks. Uh, lovely to see you as always. Well, yeah, it's my, my annual visit. Your annual visit, that's right. We'll have to get you on the show in the middle of the year when it's nice and sunny as well, by the way. Well, the amount of effort that went into this morning, I'll tell you, and to get up early. But hey, um, yeah, I, I think leading on a little bit from what Alex and, and Neil have been talking about is about the economy. I mean, for me, I think um, the BBC were talking this morning that actually spend is slightly up, but it's on different things. And I think that's what we're starting to see is that people, and they were saying supermarkets are actually doing quite nicely already. They usually peak closer to Christmas. But what they're saying is they think that people are buying in, in sort of their stockpiling now, ready for Christmas, and they're doing it in gradual bits. And I think that's that's all about customer behaviour and changes. And I think that, that this year has become really, really significant, mm -hmm. that we're all changing the way that we purchase, we're all changing the way we shop, we're all changing um, what our priorities are. And I think we see that, um, particularly at the Cheltenham Trust, um, and I'll just give you an example for us now, what we recognise is that the more events we can do that are absolutely free for everybody, that's what drives footfall. And what we will see then is that those people that attend the events are quite happy to then purchase on the food and drink because mm. they see that as the treat mm. and part of the experience, but they haven't had to pay to come to that event. And I think what they're saying on the BBC this morning is that while spend is slightly up, I think it's 0.4%, so it's, it's still quite small. Actually, we're all seeing a lot less for our money. Mm. Right. So whilst we're spending more, we're getting less. Mm. So I think that's making everybody far more discerning now about what what do they spend on? Where do they allocate their, their, their precious cash flow? Because as you say, with mortgages, Sam, with, with also with utilities and with all of our food bills, as you say, Neil, escalating, I think what we have to look at then is where do you spend that money and what gives you the, the, the best bang for your bucks? And that's exactly what the BBC was saying this morning. The whole story was in and around economy is slightly up minutely up but actually we're all getting a lot less for it okay no good point well a bit of a contentious issue a bit of a contentious 
a bit of a contentious issue, Mark, but, you know, do we think that there are people who are, I mean, there's some big bonuses being paid out to supermarket staff for their performance in this period of time. I mean, food inflation, I think, is a really serious challenge uh, to, yeah. to the country. And, um, and, and I, I think it's out of control, I've got to be honest. And, and people can make choices, don't get me wrong. But when you're looking at, uh, at uh, art, you know, items going up four or five times what they were at, you know, a year ago, then you, you kind of think, well, actually, how much of this is actually inflation and how much of it is profiteering? And so, you know, I, I, I think it's a it's a big problem. I think the oil and gas companies have been at it. I think the food companies are at it. And, and you know, people do say there's no time to make money like in a recession. Mm. Well, I, think you're, I, I, I think you're right, Neil. And I think we're seeing the same thing with cost of supplies. You know, it's getting stupid now where you have to keep passing the cost on and on and on. And at what point is it going to stop where somebody's going to say this is just ridiculous? Well, it comes to a point where people can't afford to buy. It's, it's quite similar as that. And the consumer mm. suddenly stays at home and decides to eat at home and doesn't as takeaway, doesn't go for a meal, doesn't uh, give to charity. I'm going to have to go over to Ian now. That's not because uh, I don't have to, but I'd like to. Ian, give us your best ho, 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 please. Ho, ho, ho! Um, I just want much. to talk, I want to get back onto the papers a little bit before I talk about business. Thank you um, for that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, this is what this is about, isn't it? The papers and what's on. Um, the Daily Express, which is uh, very much a Tory supporting paper, their main headline for nurses for Britain, sit down and sort this out. Government have got to do that. That seems to me their big priority. Uh, they base their uh, offer on things a year ago uh, before Ukraine, whatever. So that's that's important. The other thing is this, that the Daily Telegraph lead, NHS on high alert for flu outbreak. I'm very involved with the NHS and a lot of trust for organ donation. This is a big, big issue and uh, it's not going to go away. Uh, my wife has been quite ill for a few weeks now. Uh, you go to the pharmacist, they say, oh, take paracetamol, do this. You ring the doctor, same sort of thing. There's a lot of this going on. And lots of people are uh, are getting quite ill. Um, my old paper, the Daily Mail, uh, to type has done 17 pages on Harry and Meghan, if you just want to sort of go through all that. Uh, but their headline, Dignity in the Face of Treachery, The Sun, The Traitor, and the Daily Star, Dad told Whoppers, and my scary brother screamed at me, Perhaps the best piece is uh, by Sarah Vine, the male's columnist, who is the ex-wife of Michael Gove. And uh, have a read of this. The ultimate narcissists in an age of narcissism, <laughs> even Kim Kardashian's more selfie, shy than these two. And the Times leader says, if they're so fed up with Britain and everything, why don't they just hand in their titles? Uh, I can't understand why they don't. Going back to business, uh, Mark, we've just got a Business West survey out today. Uh, we've talked to 350 businesses in the Southwest. And as everyone has said, basically, uh, the results are that sort of political and economic stability has had a real impact on their business in the last quarter. Uh, we see this continuing into the new year. I think it's going to be a very tough year. We've talked about energy. Big crucial time is April, when the government is saying they're going to help a vulnerable business businesses. What's a vulnerable business? You know, every I think that's uh, that, that's going to be important. A um, few sort of light things. Love the Sun story about the uh, penguin that's turned up in Margate. Now it may have come out of a local zoo, but it's a bit parky, says the Sun. And we've got a couple of quite big things this weekend. We've got the World Cup final. And uh, with my wife be interested in Strictly Come Dancing final. Mm -hmm. So they're all in the mix. Okay. Well, thanks very much. A good old roundup of the papers there. Thanks ever so much for you, Ian. Thank you. Talitha, 
great to have you on the show. Sorry you, you're last, but someone has to be. It used, used to be me when they were lining up to pick the uh, football players when I was a kid. I was always the last one to be picked, even by my by my brother. Right, Talitha. What? Last but not least, as they say. Um, the best, I'm the best to last. Yeah. I mean, we are very much caught up in a crisis um, world of lurching from crisis to crisis, which makes us very much about today. But I think if we don't look at the future, we're in trouble. And I think we've got to plan for the future. There's an element of if we don't think about the future, what's that going to look like? So I'm going to dig into the nurses strike for a couple of reasons. One, it's the first strike they've had in a century. Mm. And whatever your beliefs are, whether they walk out and feel like people are going to be um, not looked after at this time of year is really terrible. But I think there's a point to be made. Our NHS is one of the most amazing things in this country. And what I'm really, really, really upset about is the fact that nurses are queuing at food banks. That's the reality. So what is the value on the price of somebody and what they do? That's the problem we have. Why are we paying a nurse when they start at 25 to 27,000, when they can't actually pay off their 70,000 pound student loan and they can't actually afford to heat their homes and feed people. And then they go in and do an 80 hour shift a week to try and pay the bills and save people. This to me is absolutely ridiculous. The state we're in about who we pay what to and what value we have. Now there is around, <laughs> 60,000 vacancies in the NHS. So if we think about it, if we don't look after this sector, A, they're all leaving to go and work in supermarkets and warehouses to get paid more. So we're losing talent and they're not retaining anybody because people are leaving. And as far as the nurses are saying, most of the people they talk to who are currently working and looking for other jobs. Now, if we don't look after the NHS, we may be well now, but like Ian says, the moment we get ill, is the only time we seem to value them. You know, we all clapped last year and, you know, over the years we've all said, oh, how wonderful they are. Yet the government is looking at a pay increase based on the start of the year before all of these problems mm -hmm. that we've had. So if in real terms, we've got seven and... 0.2 million people on a waiting list that's huge do you imagine the pressure so these nurses are saying there's supposed to be four people on a ward for 28 patients and they're down to two people mm. and they're leaving people li li lying in their own waste they can't clean their teeth we're not looking after human beings and the government is going to have to find the money they have not been given pay rises for so long in terms of probably they've not had a 20 percent increase while well, other government officials have had a 20 percent increase over the same period you know our government officials are doing very well with their expenses and everything else they seem to get so i am really really for the fact that these nurses are saying it's more dangerous if we don't strike and try and sort things out mm. than if we do strike and they haven't left people worse off they've clubbed together and made sure there's enough people to keep things going but you know you cannot pay people 25 27 000 and expect them not to queue at food banks this is just unacceptable 80 hour weeks it's just unacceptable so i think if we need to think about our future we need to get behind our services and make sure we don't lose them it's funny what you said, actually, because you, you're right, actually, you don't normally think of these things until you actually use the service itself. It's the same as teachers. It's the same everything. OK, look, I'll go to Ian, then I go to Neil. Ian. Yeah, uh, Talitha is absolutely right. And uh, how does the government possibly square paying uh, doctors uh, from a private agency £5,000 per shift in this cir these circumstances? Uh, there needs to be a root and branch reform of the health service yes it's brilliant but it's gargantuan and it needs to change and the total figures are something like 130,000 vacancies and as Talitha says 7 million do the maths it doesn't add up mm. at all no there's no way they're going to get it back Neil what are you going to say well I think I think this has been not only in the health service I think this is being seen across all sectors at the moment that the gaps are getting bigger the problem mm -hmm. if you give 5% to a person who's on 20% uh, on 20,000 a year mm -hmm. that's not the same as giving 5% to someone who's on a million pounds a year and so the gap is getting bigger and I I've, I've got to be honest uh, you know I feel as though there's going to be a crunch point at which you know the uh, <laughs> people have just had enough and 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 I know you know, from my own experience of running factories and, and how much pressure everybody is under, 
within the health service, the, the issue is not the individuals who are delivering the service. The issue is in the strategy, I believe, from the top. And so, yeah, uh, my cousin was involved in trying to sort out one of the, um, the, the London authorities where people were getting taxis instead of taking the tube. And they were, you know, if you were in a certain bracket, you know, money was no object. We're out just for, you know, moving people around, you know. And to me, that's 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 not about that's that's all about productivity. But but you know, what we're seeing is those at the bottom end of the spectrum are being crushed by these cost of living increases and mm -hmm. by you know inflationary pressure. And then the guys at the top, you know, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're doing okay, to be honest, mm -hmm. you know, and there's big bonuses. And I said, there's bonuses being paid in, in the retail sector, especially food. Uh, you know, you kind of feel like the world is coming to a bit of a crunch, you know, and, and I don't think it will take much uh, for it to tip it over the edge. That's my view anyway. To totally right, guys. I hate to say it, but we've we've running. We're running out of time. We're only supposed to do half an hour, and, and already we're already we're twenty five minutes in. So I, what I'm going to do is, uh, I, I think we could actually open the debate a little bit. I know that Ian is quite keen to talk about uh, about the media and the way that clickbait is working through the actual media at the moment, and we have X two X editors here as well. So let's let's drill, drill a little bit on that if you like. And uh, and then we'll go on to uh, what stories caught your eye in the punchline. So very quickly, Ian, uh, and we'll get yeah. the opinion of everybody um, in the room. Look, uh, this is not, uh, you know, a big shout out just for punchline, but what has happened in Gloucestershire, and I've edited here for what, 18 years or so and in Bristol, the business side of things is so strong that punchline has developed uh, business life has developed, stoke loss has developed, and business and innovation has developed. Why is that? The reason is, is that we have a great business community here who work together. Uh, I know that, uh, Neil knows that, and Sam knows that totally. So what gets me, though, is that the print side of things, when they do publish, uh, they don't look at issues, uh, I'm afraid. Uh, a lot of it is clickbait, but this is really a big shout out for the business community. You know, I've been judging the business main business awards here for about 17 years. We had the best entries this year, and you came to that, Mark, than we've ever had. <clears throat> Lots of great startup businesses. So my, my thing is this, that business is alive and kicking. Communication is really good. People like Punchline are really important, and we've got to keep at it. Okay, no, thank you, thank you very much. Anybody want to add to that at all? I would add to that in so yeah. far as um, because we obviously, as as the growth of as a growth network across the county, you know, we're sort of seeing great business stories all the time, and um, we try to sort of share those stories as much as we can across all of the media. But I do think. There is also a, there is a challenge where I think people have just been so busy doing the job that, that, that there isn't the opportunity to kind of stay, take a step back and do some more of the horizon scanning stuff. So I completely agree with Ian and I think there is a real call for that because I think the, the role of the media, you know, certainly the business community should be to kind of raise themes and open challenge and discussion rather than just report what's happened, which is more PR. Mm. The want of a better word and you know we're as guilty of that as the next person um because we're sort of you know we're pushing case studies and success stories but i think you know the opportunity to kind of hit some of these big some of these big issues which is why i think this works so well i love you know i love punchline talks because i think it is one of the the few mediums where people actually get to just go off piste you know and not not be too scripted and actually talk about some key trends and themes um i would say we have quite a heavy media presence for a relatively small county um, so I do think one of the challenges is for for each of those sort of, you know, editorial channels to find new and different ways of saying stuff. Mm. I think sometimes, you know, we do see the same stories and very often you see the same sort of local heroes and local pieces. And it's to do with the power that they've got behind them in terms of getting those stories out. But I would take my hat off and say that I also think we've got really proactive editors, you know, that are trying their best to come out and, and dig stories out. But I hope, you know, I think going back to Talitha's point, really, I think 
you know, if we can get into the new year and have a situation where we can actually take a step back, take a breath, and just do a bit more horizon scanning. I think we've all been forced down a road where we're so tactical. You know, mm. we're so busy just kind of getting to the end of the day and the next day and the next day that I think, you know, hopefully hopefully next year is when we'll see some of these changes happen. Okay, we're gonna to go to Laurie, then Sam, and then Talifa, but that's the order that just popped up your hand. So very quickly, guys. <laughs> yep, okay. I just want to say that um, I think that Punchline, I'm gonna be honest and um, say this, I think media's changed a lot particularly over recent years. I think it's shifted away from what I, I would recall as the old traditional journalism where, where businesses and public bodies were held to account. And actually, I think, Mark, you're probably the only one in Gloucester that, that, that does that at local level quite so much where you get underneath stories. Mm -hmm. I think there's an awful lot of just cut and paste from businesses into without any journalism or delving and I think you do yeah. do that and I think we we need that because we need to know that if there are things that aren't quite right who's actually holding who to account and and for me journalism was always about that mm. I spent many many years I mean most of my life in local government as as the director of communications and I found media were, you know, were, were my lifeblood because that's what, what I was every single day taking calls and calls and calls from journalists and good journalists that were really probing and trying to get underneath why we hadn't done something or why we had done something. Whereas now that seems it, it, it's gone. And I think Punchline, I will hold, hold my hand up to you that I think you still do that. And some of the stories when we come on to that from this week, I think you've got underneath some of the issues that we all knew were there and bubbling, but you've got them. Well, that's very kind of you. Know, thanks very much. And I know which story you're alluding to there as well. Which yeah. Is Sam, over to you then, Talitha, and we we'll go quickly through the story of the weeks from all yeah, of you. Yeah, yeah, very time. briefly, because I think in in summed it up perfectly, and we you all have, really. I mean, I, I think it, it's interesting, because Ian and I were both newspaper editors in different parts of the country, sometimes close mm -hmm. together, but um, people used to think we used to knock our communities. There's nothing further yeah. from the truth. We were most passionate people about our communities, you can imagine. And we wanted them to succeed. So I think the media work that we led, uh, which Mark is now leading, is almost there as a critical friend. We want to make this, this community as good as it can possibly be. And in this case, it's a business community as strong as it can possibly be. But that doesn't mean you gloss over the, what's bad happening. I remember as an editor, once having, and Ian will have had this many times, people saying, why didn't you ever print good news? And I went through the paper and identified like probably three quarters of it was good news. But what they considered bad news wasn't bad news. it was news mm. if, if somebody's been knocked mm. over in the streets that is bad news but it, we can't pretend it hasn't happened because then you you're glossing you know, and making things artificial and that as alex i think said was is pr uh and so there's an important role to be played for the media but the media has changed the, the very fact that alex said that this is a really important source of business debate this wouldn't have happened five years ago you know it shows that the media has changed and we've got to change with it but the best media i always think is a, a critical friend, someone that believes as passionate as anyone in their community, but isn't scared to say, hang on, we can do things better. Mm -hmm. And Mark, you do an amazing job, full stop. Well, that's very kind. I'm not always the most popular person in the room, which sometimes- You shouldn't have to be, but you will be sometimes. <laughs> so just quickly, just to sum up. Yes, just to sum up media wise, I think the third sector had been very overlooked pre pandemic and really didn't get any airspace. And I don't think anyone really saw the value. I and mean, we were still very overlooked, but, but it's got better. And I think what's pointed me in a direction of communicating with all the outlets, Mark's been number one, you know, written media, so supportive of the third sector, really representing all sectors. And I think that's so important. But actually, I was really upset to hear the cut that the cut to our local radio, BBC gloss has been amazing. And you know, localism is so important. And then the BBC start cutting local radio. I think that's appalling. They do an amazing job. And you've got people like Steve Nibbs of BBC points west you know they have been so supportive to our sector and constantly come to me for stories and want the sector represented so a huge shout out to all of our media in our county who are hugely positive and supportive and obviously mark printed media is absolutely brilliant and hugely supportive to our sector so thank you well that's very very kind of you thank you very much okay let's go over to punch that's a great lead in and we're going to start with neil because he's in my top left hand corner neil uh, so um, we're going to have so, a quick roundup. Um, a quick roundup of 
The story on the screen. I was going to go for the punchline, punchline story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's what I was going to do. You did confuse me there with a quick roundup there. You nodded but, off, didn't uh, you? The, you nodded off. I, I was looking. No, no, no. I was interested in the debate, actually. I think social media is changing the world uh, quite mm quite dramatically and I think there'll be a revolution around social media as well but anyway uh, we'll, we'll leave, that, leave that to one side I mean the the good news story for me was the university receiving this 5.8 million pounds in order to uh, provide these much needed skills in engineering mm -hmm. and cyber you know we've got GCHQ it is the jewel of the county whichever way you look at it 5,000 people employed there plans for another 5,000 on the development and uh, it's important that we bring these skills into the county. The county will die if we don't see this influx of skills and, uh, and enthusiasm that we need. It, it comes back to all the conversations we've had today. You know, communities are built on people, they're built on jobs, and uh, this is a way of providing those skills which provides uh, the, the companies to grow. Okay, thanks very much for that, Neil. Alex, what have you picked up from this week's punch? Um, obviously the university story, we, we, we're happy about that. Um, I suppose the, the second story as well, which plays back to the conversations we've been having about localism and also, I can't remember who it was, but about shopping local, was the fact that, you know, not the biggest news in the world, but the fact that the, the council are doing free parking in Gloucester to try and help drive footfall into the city, which I just think is bloody brilliant. Yep. Um, I think it's, you know, it's an example of something that yeah. the council can do that they have the control over to do, which actually makes a huge difference, you know, not only to the people who are going in to do their shopping, but to all of those businesses, you know, Gloucester City, especially, we've been doing quite a lot of work with, with the council on the future of Gloucester Vision. Mm -hmm. um, and I think one of the, you know, one of the things that's come out loud and clear about that is the fact that everyone's very proud of Gloucester, and, you know, everyone can see the opportunity for Gloucester, but there is this real, real problem with the city centre. So I think, you know, I was personally just really, really pleased to see that, that the council have done something, you know, very simple, incredibly constructive, that basically supports business and also the community as well. Um, so that was my my win story. Couldn't agree more with you there, Alex. Mm. Ian, what have you picked out from this week's podcast? Well, I've got the same story, really. Um, free parking is a gift for festive shoppers, was your headline. Mm. It's simple, isn't it? But so important. Look at Cribs Causeway. Free parking. People are coming from Cardiff all over. Mm. Uh, Alex is right, you know, both of us have worked on the city centre for years and how we're going through it. It's pretty dire still, isn't it? Yeah, uh, it's not got any better, you know, I must admit at the moment it is pretty... What is exciting, actually, about the city centre to me is the Debenhams transformation. Mm. And just look at the storyboards around the operation. They're absolutely fascinating. I did a film with the Vice-Chancellor recently walking around. It is amazing. And when we get thousands of young people coursing through the streets, hopefully that's going to make a difference. Mm. But this is a big, big issue. Gloucester City Centre, still. OK, thanks so much, Ian. Uh, Laurie, what have you picked up from this week's Punch Night, please? Yeah, mine. mine's very local and very um, cl close to us. Um, it's um, the, I'm going to go with the bad and the good. So the bad is that you've reported that the Minister Exchange is, is um, now heavily overspent, which I don't think any of us were surprised about, because if you look out of the back of the Wilson and you go to that development, you can see that it's not progressing and that there's obviously been issues and there's issues all in and around the transformation of the Minster uh, grounds area. I mean, for that, that, that for me, it wasn't a surprise, but it was a surprise that it's 2.5 million overspent. Yep. Uh, you know, I thought you, you, you perhaps, you know, I think um, a little bit as to why that's happened. Of course, it's Brexit. Of course, it's supplies. But others of us have also done major development projects in exactly the same, same time frame and delivered them on time and in budget. And, um, you know, for me, I think you maybe could have gone a bit harder as a journey, but that's only because of the way we read it. And I do appreciate that, you know, they're saying they will get it open, albeit now it's going to be summer 23. So it keeps going back and back. That for us is a big issue because obviously we've done huge investment into the Wilson. But thank you for, for also doing our good news that we've secured the next tranche of funding from the government and from um, other supporters and including the council have put the last little bit of money in so that we can completely now refurbish the old wing of the building and the Wilson is completely transformed or will be within the next 12 months. No, so, good. yeah, bad and good. Thank you. 
Thank you very much for that. And I'd just like to say that that, that original story came out from a, I've been watching that story for a while. Mm. And it kept kicking the can and they sent a very bland press release out with no detail, no money. Mm. And then we put a freedom of information request to Cheltenham Borough Council. And it was amazing how quickly the, uh, the uh, should we start saying the, the, the sort of chickens and clucking around and all the rest of it. But yeah. I'm very proud that we stuck to the story. We had it around yeah. three weeks beforehand. And we we uh, we work very closely and tightly on it. And you are right; we were quite gentle. I felt yeah. with the actual thing. We could have named more of the directors. We could have gone into a bit more detail. But we were down to time, unfortunately. Laurie. That's that's the only thing. But we probably yeah. will go back and revisit it. And it's a great shame because it's going to be a great asset to Cheltenham. Um, yeah. It will. Right, we're going to move on because we don't have very much time. Sam, what have you picked out from this week's punch? Yeah, well, well done, the Cheltenham. I'm going to go back to parking actually for May because. Um, uh, my stepdaughter, Kim, took her daughter, Lola, to a um, pantomime in Cheltenham last week. And I said to her, the first question I said to her was, um, what was the panto like? And she said, would you believe it cost me £15 to park? I says, pardon? She says, I was there five hours, it cost me £15 to park. And that was her first answer. Well, Punchline reported this week that it's now going to be free park and ride from our court into Cheltenham until January the 2nd. Why wouldn't you use it? I'll just say this to her. Why wouldn't you use a park and ride? The park and ride is brilliant. Mm. I never drive into Cheltenham anymore from Gloucester. Use the park and ride and it's free until January the 2nd. I think that's great. I think st- and that, that really will affect trade. So all the yeah. businesses in Cheltenham, small businesses and big businesses will benefit from people having that £15 to spend in the shops rather than on a car park. It's crazy, isn't it? It's perfect. I actually uh, went to the Nook, the Nook, whatever it's called, uh, yeah. the Quad Triangle. Mm. And uh, it was great, and I had a great time there. And then I got a parking ticket. It cost oh. thirty-five quid of uh, oh. on top as well, which uh, which I kicked myself through. Right, Talitha, we're going to finish with you. Mm-hmm. What's the story from this week's punchline, please? Well, I just love this one because it's so heartwarming, and it's all about working together and actually sustainability. So mine was about the house builder Bellway donating their huge pile of pallets to Men and Sheds. Now, I love Men and Sheds. Mm-hmm. It's one of the few organisations that support men. There's not a lot out there for men. Um, And certainly not if you're maybe on your own, you've lost your wife and you're pretty lonely and maybe your friendship groups declined. Um, Men in Sheds is absolutely amazing. And what they're going to do with these pallets is um, they're going to use them to make bird boxes, hedgehog hotels and planters. And so I just love it. It's absolutely brilliant. They're only down the road from them. And it's just businesses, charity, community working together to produce great things out of waste. Um, And I absolutely love the fact you featured that story. I think it's very important. Okay, thank you very much. And I'd just like to start thank my fantastic panel today and all the guests that we've had for this year as well. I can't be thankful enough. I'd also like to thank a big thank you to our sponsors, Hayeswoods Accountants and Business Advisors, who have been absolutely brilliant supporting us this year. Because, of course, without sponsorship, without advertising, we just don't have a business. We cannot do what we do. Uh, so I'd like to thank everybody for that. And will we join in this? Please join us for part two, which we're coming out on Wednesday very shortly, where we pick the stories for the year. OK, thank you very much. Have a wonderful Christmas. Ho, ho, ho. Bye. Ho, ho, ho. <laughs>